Our today's guest is Patrick Joyce. If you are in sales, sales development, you don't know him, I feel sorry for you because you're missing a lot. A teacher tone salesperson, this guy is like creme de la creme of sales development, like 1% of the top 1%. Top companies want him to consult today. Whenever I see him, I, he's just giving without asking anything in return. And uh, maybe that's a reason for his success. My team and I have personally followed his tips and tricks and have got results. Let's find out what makes Patrick great at what he does. Uh, Patrick, welcome Patrick to the Sales Spin Show. And I'm really happy to actually have you here. And uh, for different reasons, for like many reasons, okay? Uh, I think I've been connected with you ever since I think I was connected with Justin. I've been a part of Salesforce, learned so much from you. I mean, I think I was probably the first one to buy the book <laughs> and uh, I followed your strategies. Some of them have worked for me, some of them have not. And I would say maybe, maybe that's a way I kind of, you know, applied it. For example, Venn diagrams. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Venn diagrams. Uh, in fact, I'm in the process of creating one right now for my current company. And uh, it has mm -hmm. kind of worked for my previous one. So, and one of my ex rep is a big fan of all the strategies which you have deployed. He has deployed all the strategies, seen success. And at the same time, I think I deployed something uh, of a recent strategy. I can't recall what was that, but definitely worked. And uh, I thought, you know, uh, I, we should talk, man. I mean, the, you are, I mean, it goes without saying, I think you are the SDR king as the world has already crowned you. So we, we would be more than happy to learn from your strategies. Like, how did, how did you become like a superstar? <laughs> oh my gosh, man, I'm honored. I don't even know um, how to respond to that. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I'm honored. Honestly, um, yeah, yeah, I'm flabbergasted because I worked really, really, really hard um, for a long time uh, before I became an SDR. And didn't nearly have as, as much success over a long period of time as I have in a really short period of time as an SDR. You know, I, um, two thousand October of 2017 is when I, when I took my first job in tech and, you know, it's hasn't even been, it's been about four years and it's, you know, um, um, uh, the, the ride that I've been on has been so incredible, like just unbelievable. So, I mean, it's music to my ears to hear that other people are using some of the stuff that I came up with, some of the stuff that uh, Justin came up with that I helped him to, mm -hmm. I don't know, get into um, a format where other people could understand it. Other people could, could uh, absorb it and use it. Uh, right. It just, it makes me really happy to hear that. So I know I didn't, I probably just didn't even answer your question, but I'm sort of, <laughs> you know, taken back by it. Uh, just, just because of, yeah, it, it's surreal to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I was looking at your recent poll uh, as well, which you, which you started a few days ago, right? Where you ask what makes a uh, salesperson successful, you know? And I think most people kind of voted for grit. Do you think that is, yep. that is true for you or do you think that's something else? I think when I came up with that poll, uh, what I was really doing was um, trying to generate discussion. I, I knew right. that it would generate discussion because to me, it's like, I said it in one of the comments. Um, it's really the, the, the answer that I think of in my head is almost like a bartender recipe, right? It's like you're making a Long Island iced tea or something <laughs> and you need a little bit of each ingredient. Right. It's like, you know, it's two parts grit, one part empathy, you know, one part, pro you know, whatever, product knowledge and industry yeah. knowledge. And, and I picked those things because, um, you know, on their own, if you were to, only say you know uh just product knowledge that that's the key to sales success it's like that's like the obvious wrong answer <laughs> right <laughs> yeah. but but clearly you need to know something about the product in order to be able to sell it right um and then you know maybe one layer deeper would be industry knowledge so like if you have product knowledge it's great but if you have industry knowledge it's actually even stronger if you have really really strong industry knowledge you probably don't need to know much about the product Fair enough. Because if you know the industry, you understand what the other person, what the person on the other end of the line does with their time and how you might be able to impact that. And you can speak to that. And then that makes it easier to sell. It makes it easier to start the conversation. But I think the superpower is really in the empathy piece. Like grit is, is one of those things that um, 
it's an intangible. You're going to need grit no matter what career you're in, right? It's not just specific to sales. Uh, if you do physical labor outside, you have to be really gritty. If you're, I don't know, a um, uh, 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 finance a- analyst or something, you know, you work for like McKinsey or, you, you know, you're a gardener yeah. or something like that. You're, you're an analyst. It's like you still have to really kind of have that grit to like um, uh, work through things and, and crunch the numbers and, and dig deeper and like try to understand and like power through things, you know, like overcome mm-hmm. objection, you know, not necessarily objections in a sale, but like overcome obstacles, right? You, you're going to need the grit no matter what. But I think for selling, um, empathy is really the key. And I think one of the reasons why um, I was able to do well in sales right away without much of a background is because I was a teacher. And when I was a teacher, that's also the key to the whole thing is being able to understand what the students are thinking, right? Because as a subject matter expert, um, there's so many parallels between teaching and sales. Um, you could be the smartest mathematician on the face of the planet, mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean that you can teach math, right? You, you need to be able to understand what the person that doesn't know how to do the problem is thinking in their head and how to see the classroom from their angle. Like you really need to be able to do that because if you get stuck in the mindset of somebody that knows how to do it, it becomes very, very, very difficult for you to communicate with um, the rest of the people that don't. It's like you're just not on the same page. And, and once that happens, it's like you kind of lose the room really quickly, right? It's like um, it, it becomes an us versus them scenario where you're the teacher standing at the front of the room and then everybody else, there's 30 people that are out there in the crowd mm-hmm. and they're looking at each other like, D- is this guy with us? Like, does he know what's going <laughs> on? And, and it's, it is kind of the same in sales, right? Like, you know, the product so well, and you're talking a mile a minute to the prospect, they have no idea what you're talking about. So you have to be able to pause for a minute and think about the world from their perspective. Um, and if you can do that really effectively, um, it makes it a lot easier to communicate. And then all of a sudden, you know, selling is, is, uh, almost a natural consequence. Fair enough, right? fair you're, enough. you're guiding, uh, guiding the buyer through the buying process rather than, uh, trying to convince them that, to do one thing or the other. Got it. So Patrick, I do have a follow-up question on this. Now, um, I can, I can, I'm actually seeing a trend. A lot of successful people I see are not coming, not, are not the ones who started their career in sales. They come from like different background altogether. And I'm, I can see that's the same case with you as well. Now, a lot of people, let's say, who are, you know, out there, you know, people like me who, who are not teachers. And uh, what you're saying, you know, what teacher, being, being a teacher kind of taught you is like immensely valuable. How can you teach that to other people? Is there a way people can learn that on, on their own? Um, I don't think that it has to be from teaching. I think for me, it, it, it came from being a teacher, but I, I don't mm-hmm. think that it has to be, you know, um, uh, it, I think that the, if I was to uh, remove all the specifics um, mm-hmm. from the quality that I'm talking about, what it really comes down to is, um, you know, stepping out of your own point of view. And, and seeing the world from somebody else's angle, that's the, the overarching um, principle or skill. Like that's the skill that you really need to be able to do. Um, and, you know, you can, you can think about that even, so I'm not a parent, right? I don't have any children, but mm-hmm. those that do, if you do have children, right, you have to be able to see the world from your child's perspective. You have to be able to think about like, you know, um, like, what is Timmy thinking here? Or, or you know, what is my child going to do when I put them in this scenario? It's really the same thing. So you, you can come at it from like many, many different angles, I feel like. I don't know no. if that answered your question or not, but it, no, you know, it, it like does. I'm, I'm just trying to like, uh, get go, go a little deeper. Okay. So mm-hmm. for example, uh, let, let's assume that, you know, I, I have no experience in sale. This is my first job. Okay. This is going to be my first job. Yeah. And I, I, I take your point and I, I, now I understand in order for me to be successful, I have to understand other point, point, other person's point of view. 
So that's that's very really good in theory. I'm just trying to understand how can how yeah. can I you know put that into practical practicality, right? So yeah, um, yeah. How do you how do you action that, right? Like, yeah. what, what is the what is the action plan to, to right. accomplish that? And this is I'm glad that you um, I'm glad that you're digging in here because this is a really good point. The number one thing that you can do in my pers- it, from my angle, uh, right, it, is go and talk to customers. Like marketers do this all the time. They go and they interview customers and they figure out like current customers, not prospects now. I mean, people that have already bought the product or service, um, you know, the last five contracts that closed and, and you can ask them, you know, what caused you to make a move here? Like, how did, how did you end up deciding that you should invest in this technology or this service um, you know, what were you dealing with at the time? What did this make better for you? Uh, and, and why did you decide on, on this one versus an alternative solution? You know, what, what, was, what were the deciding factors here? And, you know, you, if you only ask one customer, you might get something like, oh, well, you know, I had a relationship with Tim and, and Tim's a really good guy. And, you know, you'll find stuff like that. But if you mm-hmm. keep digging, if you keep asking uh, you're going to learn a lot about uh, that that type of customer's world, right? Like you, you can even break it down by persona. You, you could break it down by uh, if you're selling a VP of sales, if you're selling to an ops person, if you're selling to a marketing person, all the different stakeholders that are involved in any of those deals. Uh, you should go and get an angle from them and, and get a handful each. Uh, and it, I don't think it's something that, that people do often enough. Um, because that's really the keys to the kingdom right there. Uh, you know, all of a sudden, if you compile enough of those, um, you have stuff to bring up in conversation. So let's say I'm selling to, uh, I'm going to use VP of risk management. I use this one all the time in, in interviews because when I was a rep, that's what I was selling to, right? So it, if I'm selling a VP of risk management, um, you know, or say chief security officer or, you know, the, the CIO, the chief information officer, something like that, all those different types of data um, people. And I'm, I go and I interview five each, right? So now I've had 15 interviews. You get the CIO, the, you know, whatever, the three titles, hmm. five, five a piece. The next person that I talk to, I'm going to be able to say, yeah, you know, I, I was talking to the, the CIO of, you know, another one of our customers. And, and he said that, this was usually a problem. And, and, and that's what, um, you know, they were dealing with at the time when, when, uh, when we talked uh, about using our product, is that something that you deal with? That is like a way, way stronger um, you know, tidbit or, or a point to bring up um, in a conversation with a prospect, because all of a sudden you're, you're an expert, you're an industry expert. Now, now you have insight. You've talked to many other uh, people like them and and all of a sudden it changes it, this is how you start to begin the um the status of trusted advisor everybody's trying to get to trusted advisor well how do you do right. that first you have to be able to advise that's the first thing right <laughs> and in order to do that i have to understand the world um so i mean that's the first thing that i would do and if you can't get to the customer themselves, right? Like if, if your scenario is prohibitive and you can't actually get to the customer, go to the account manager, go to the customer success manager, the person that's in charge of managing that relationship with the customer, go and talk to them, the people that are on your team uh, and really try to understand the world of, you know, the people that you're selling to. Now that, that is actually a very valid point. And I, I'll be very honest, uh, Patrick, I think this is not the first time I've heard about this, but I think I've never acted upon this like, I'll, I'll probably acted upon this like uh, I've read the case studies, being, uh, if I'm being honest, right? And that mm-hmm. usually has the, you know, skimmed information, right? It's like, it's like the crisp, crisp uh, you know, form of the uh, five page, you know, condensed into like one page or, or like half page, or, right? So that probably yeah. misses the important pieces like you mentioned, right? Like what was going through this person's mind when he was trying to make the purchase? Uh, this was a heavy purchase, you know, which he invested in. What really made him get the budget approved? Um, what were the dependencies? So, for example, um, I'll not talk about my product, the one I'm selling. But uh, today, I read a comment from VP of Sales where he was asking how uh, you know, and this this is a big challenge which I got to know today that 
how do you ensure your team is not pushing back for this sort of a tool? Okay. So that's something which I mm-hmm. never, never, never actually thought about it. I mean, this could be a possibility that the end user does not want to use the product. It's VP sales who's trying to push the product. Yep. So that, yep. that is actually, uh, that's actually a good learning. So thank you so much for that. Uh, yeah. You said you want to talk. Go ahead, please. Well, I want to make a distinction there too, because you mentioned the case study. Um, and there's, to me, there's a big, big, big difference between reading the case study and talking to a customer or to an account manager. And, and here's the difference, is that the case study was created um, by the marketing team with the intention of convincing somebody else um, that they should do it too. You know, it's, it's really, it's written with um, self-interest in mind. Okay. Hang on. And that perspective is dangerous. Because if you show the prospect that you have your own self-interest in your top of mind, all of a sudden you're not trustworthy. You've missed the the trusted advisor, Pete, right? You've sort of um, walked yourself out of that conversation. Uh, But the case study to me is very, very useful, but it's useful for one specific element. The one thing that I'm looking for when I read a case study is what were the specific outcomes? like quantifiable outcomes of the, um, you know, the the project where, uh, you know, they signed up, um, they were able to, you know, generate 30% more leads um, every, you know, per SDR per quarter, it ended up to, you know, X dollars in revenue, something like that, you know, I'm I'm off the top of my head, some story like that, that's what I'm trying to be able to craft. And then that becomes like the punchiest, like that's the, um, that's what gets me over the line. Like that's, that's like uh, the meat of, of my messaging when I'm prospecting. Um, but it doesn't end there, right? Like the, the case study itself only is, is really for, for me as the SDR, as the prospector, as the meeting setter, um, is there for me to gather the information. And you're right, I'm looking through this longer form document and I'm like trying to pull like one specific piece of information or even like gather a, a few of them so that I have different premises that I can try in my sequence. Um, but that doesn't replace, you know, going and having a real conversation with five different CROs or five different CIOs or, you know, five different VPs of sales and, and figure out uh, how come they, they were able to get the budget and, and push the DocuSign through. No, that, that is actually totally fair. At the same time, I'm, I'm also a big fan of, you know, understanding these deeper concepts because I, I believe a lot of salespeople would kind of agree to it. You know, these deeper concepts really lead to success. For example, in your case, you know, deep, these deeper understanding, uh, finding those small nuggets, which other people are missing. Like you said, case study was kind of uh, meant to entice the prospects, entice other customers, you know, so that they can become one. This is kind of a game changer. Now, how do you use this information? Okay. Now you have spoken to five CIOs with these cells. How have you were, mm-hmm. how were you able to use this information to cut through the noise? Well, for me, it actually, I, I kind of backed into the strategy because um, as I'm, I'm prospecting, I'm, I'm holding, I'm having discovery calls, right? So I'm, I'm now I've gotten some traction. I've gotten the meeting a bunch of times. I've talked to a bunch of VPs of sales or whatever, talked to my target persona. Mm -hmm. Um, I just noticed that that was like really handy dandy to have in my back pocket to be, to have armed myself with those conversations so that the next time that I'm in that conversation, um, I have something to pull from, you know, I was like, Oh yeah, I was just talking to, um, uh, you know, a a gentleman from a, a company that's really similar to yours. Uh, you know, he was actually, yeah, a VP of risk management as well. And you know, they had trouble, um, you know, uh, verifying um, uh, the information on card applications in new markets where they hadn't done any business yet. Um, you know, if they're going to a new country or something, um, it, they didn't have the address information in that area. Uh, and that's, you know, that's why they, they came to us. Is that something that, that you guys have explored or have, have you uh, run into the same issue as that? It's like, I'm just taking whatever scenario seems to match up with the person that I'm talking to um, and and kind of pattern matching it that way. So then, you know, I abstracted the idea and instead of like just doing it during the discovery call, I said, well, why don't I just start there? 
you know, why don't I just go right for the, um, the good stuff first and go talk to people that have already signed with us, you know, instead of waiting until, um, I get a prospect on the phone that, that may or may not want to give me all that information. Somebody that already trusts us, you know, we've already got signatures. We've already signed an NDA. You can't give up any, you know, um, uh, company secret or, you know, proprietary information or anything yeah. like that. But, but common scenarios, you know, like problems that they're facing, it's perfectly valid. No, that, that's, that's, that's definitely great. Um, so let's, could, could you talk about little other strategies? Like how did you come up with those strategies? For example, Venn diagrams, for example, I mean, I thought that was like, that was like a game changer. How did you come up yeah. with that? Well, I didn't, Justin did. And, okay. and the way that Justin came up with it, I, you know, he can tell the story better than I can. <laughs> I forget who he was watching. Um, he was at um, a, a, some kind of a, a talk or conference or whatever. There was an auditorium full, full of people. And um, there was a gentleman up at the front of the room that was um, an academic, right? He wasn't, if, I, if I'm remembering the story, I'm probably butchering the story, but the guy was not really um, uh, business oriented. It wasn't like a prospecting workshop or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It was something where the guy at the front of the room was trying to explain a complex topic um, to a room full of people and the way that he did that is he had you know these these three categories um with the you know with the three circles and and summarized like his whole point he had like a, this uh you know 100 uh like a 100 slide um presentation you know it was this long all this information and he like summarized it all in one and that's when justin said like it just clicked like it, it just it hit me that i could send one of these in an email and it would um you know, it, transfer a lot of information just at a glance. So it's like a complex idea that you can tell um, with visual, which, you know, your brain is going to process 60,000 times faster than it does a paragraph, right? It, I mean, if you had to read all the detail about, you know, how these things intersect and this is, goes with this, but this one doesn't fit in there. And then that's what you lose. It's like, I mean, it's like a word maze. It's like, um, you know, you're, you're doing uh, some kind of a, a like a, um, a riddle or something to try to figure out what that paragraph says. Whereas with the visual, it just happens like instant speed. So it makes sense. It, get, it yeah. totally makes sense because we are, we are always, con you know, all the sales leaders are constantly telling, uh, you know, reps to make the email shorter, you know, uh, setting, a, setting, a, setting a word length. Hey, your email should be less than 100 words, 60 words, 65 words. And still, you know, no matter how our email, uh, how, no, no matter how good our email writing is, we're still struggling with that because we are still struggling with, hey, how can I put like everything what I want to or my messaging in less than 100 words? It's not, it's, it doesn't seem to click, right? And when you, when you send, send these images or maybe videos, right, that, that kind of does a trick. Yeah, I, I'm not as, as as big on the video um, in the top. Me neither. Of the okay. No, I love <laughs> I love using video in um, in in the sales funnel, a hundred percent. But I like to use it more after I've had a conversation. So let's say I'm telling you, I cold call you. You know, you pick up the thing in meeting. You know, I get the meeting on the calendar, and then as soon as I hang up the phone, I go, "That was a great call." I go and I yeah. record myself on my phone. And summarize what we just said. It's like, yeah, uh, you know, th thanks for um, taking some time to talk with me today. Uh, we said that, you know, you might be able to solve um, sales coaching. You know, you might be able to solve your your lead gen problem through sales coaching. So, um, you know, we set up some time on Wednesday to talk. And, and here was the main, uh, you know, the main features of what I can offer. And then give them a short overview. And this is like, you know, 60 seconds or less. Um and then I send them that video after we've had the conversation, what you'll notice is that that video will make its way around the company. Like that video will get passed on. Whereas if you just hang up the phone, right, you have the call, you hang up the phone. It's like a fleeting moment. It's going to, I mean, it just kind of evaporates into nothing. Whereas if you put the video down, it's like, it's like documenting, you know, it's it, it, the, the, the ideas that you talk about become persistent. And they and then they permeate throughout the organization. 
And then all of a sudden other people are interested, right? I mean, so to me, video is extremely powerful, but it's really hard. Um, I think it's really hard to get somebody uh, to pay attention to you when you haven't had any contact yet at all, right? Like it's hard to get somebody to even read your email, never mind watch the video. Yeah, right? yeah I totally agree. I mean, I'm not against it. it, it some people are better at, it, better at it than I am, but that's, that's what's worked for me. No, no, I totally agree. I think uh, I'm probably the same thought I've tried. Uh, somebody told me when I started with the video prospecting, hey, you have to try at least 100. And I have tried more than 200. I haven't had a success. Maybe I wasn't coach well, maybe I was not doing it right, but I think I got better with each video, but still not, not much success. Uh, I think I've seen more success with emails, uh, some success with phones, uh, definitely with LinkedIn. I, I've seen great success with LinkedIn voice notes. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, you're right. I think few people are better at few things. Uh, but I like your idea of, you know, the moment you hang up, whether the prospect was interested or not, instead of sending the long email, you send that video. I think that will kind of, that, that'll be kind of a game changer and make sense. I also will, I'll, I'll even queue up the video on the phone call. So, um, you know, to even s accelerate the, the process, right? Like instead of w making the prospect wait another week before you're going to end up on their calendar and you do another zoom call and you do the round of intros and this whole thing, it's like, listen, Raul, I'm going to give you a short demo on, uh, I mean, 60 seconds or less. I'm going to give you a quick run, you know, a, a flyby of um, what the, what the software looks like. Uh, I'll send you that a, a video over email. And all of a sudden, like, it just becomes such a powerful tool um, that you wouldn't really be able to do otherwise. You know, like, we have the technology. Why not leverage it? Now, I think that that is that is totally cool. I mean, if I'm being honest, yeah, I, I've never done that. I've never, yeah. I've never, I've never got off the phone with a prospect and said, and this happens a lot, right? Uh, I think my, my teams have been always responsible to set up meetings. These meetings are at least sometimes, a lot of times, you know, one week apart. And, and we know the no shows, no shows, right. Which happens. I think that, that that's mm -hmm. a clear way to engage with the prospect, tell them you're serious about the game, tell them, you know what, there, there's something they have to look up to. And that's why that's where teasers come into picture, right? These are, these are like movie trailers. That's right. That's right. And the other thing is that um, it stands out because how many other reps are doing that? Right. Fair I mean, enough. there's, it, <laughs> I'm not, there's I'm, not I'm, that I'm many people. That, that's, a, that's a clear yeah, sign if, you, if you were able to evaluating the noise. five different vendors, right? Let's yeah. say they're evaluating five vendors that do the same thing. Uh, one of them sends a video and then the other four don't. Well, you know, which one's top of mind, right? I mean, you don't get a second chance to make the first impression. The org. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you can see, you can track the activity on it, right? Like the videos have, have tracking on them yeah. so that you can see how many people watched it, how much of the video they got through, where they dropped off. You know, what part was interesting to them? Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's that's how I like to leverage video. Awesome. So um, I'm almost like halfway through the book. Uh, so I'll not talk about the book. What I want to understand is where do you see sales development is headed? Let's say if we were to talk about, and, and, and we all know, right, how it has changed since the time you came in, Justin came in, you know, in the last two or three years, it has drastically changed the way, for example, when I started as an SDR. So where do you see this will change three or four years from now, you said you want to talk about some career paths. Yeah. Now I have a really radical um, kind of. That's what I'm expecting. Perspective on this, right? Yeah. I, I've got an answer that I don't think that many other people are going to give, but this is honestly where I see it going. And um, I'll tell you why after, but this is what I see. I think that the prospecting role, that the SDR role, sales development is going to become the elite sales position, right? Like right now, closers get all the glory and, mm -hmm. and they get the most resources and they get the most funding. Um, but I think it's almost unanimous across the board. If you ask anybody, if you ask account executives, if you ask sales leaders, if you ask SDRs, what's the most difficult part of, of the sales process is opening. Yeah. So why do the least experienced people with the least amount of resources that get paid the least that, you know, why is it there? Why do we put those people in charge of the most important part of the process? that's the most difficult to do. 
right? It's the first impression that you make. So in the way that I see this playing out is all of a sudden, for one, uh, the, the structure of the, the SDR to AE uh, handoff, that, that ratio, right? You've got like, um, sometimes it's, it's even a one-to-one -one ratio where you have one SDR setting up meetings for one account executive, or sometimes you have one to two, you know, there's one SDR setting up meetings for two account executives, or mm -hmm. even in some cases you have two SDRs setting up meetings for one account executive. Like it, I've even seen that before. Um, I think that's going to change for one that the first thing that'll change is that the SDR is going to become more powerful with the technology. I mean, the technology is going to advance to the point where if I'm the SDR, I can handle appointments for 10 account executives, right? I, I wow. think that that's, we're, we're really close to that. I think that we're really close to that. If we can get the data cleaned up, get the workflows, um, you know, automate the, even automate the writing of the email. I've seen some crazy stuff with like G, uh, GPT-3, uh, you know, um, if I didn't have to spend time writing or finding the data or doing all these like, you know, sort of arduous tasks um, that nobody else feels like doing, if I can, if I can leverage technology um, to sort of make that a faster process. And then all I'm doing is I'm using my human intuition to try to figure out where's the propensity um, for the, the next best account, right? Like um, who's likely to close, right? If, if those are the decisions that I'm making, I can set up, you know, appointments for, you know, I could fill up the calendar to the point where you just have to keep feeding me uh, account executives because I'm going to run out of room. Um, so th there's one. And then two, I think that uh, when that starts to happen, that the prospecting role is going to turn into like the Navy SEAL. Like that's the, some, that's something you have to graduate into. That's something you have to earn. You have to earn that spot and it should be highly compensated. Um, and that's, you know, I, that's upside down compared to what anybody else would tell tell you but that's um th that's kind of how i see it going no i i really like that what you said and i think it makes sense uh i'll give you a contrast to what, what, what's happening for example where i am in india it's it's one role which i would say i think um and i'm pretty sure it, it's the same probably uh, everywhere else as well but there are not many as there, there are not many sdrs in india of course you know if you compare this to uk or europe or you know us and I think I was just reading this stat today that there are about 7,000 jobs or job openings available in UK. That would not be the case in India. So there's definitely um, there's definitely a problem with the demand and supply here. Okay, and it's still mm -hmm. even 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 after that, the role is still looked upon, you know, down upon. That hey, it's at the end of the day, they are all setting up just appointments. Uh, like you said, at the end of the day, A's closures cannot close, you know, unless they don't have anything on the plate. They don't get the same respect. So I think when you said that, I think it, I, I can I can totally see that happening, uh, especially given what has changed in the last one or two years, where there was a time I remember, you know, one SDR, for example, working with these big companies would set up like eight or 10 meetings a month. Now we see that's happening like w once a week, right? You know, and their SDRs were setting up eight, 10 meetings a week, right? So I can totally see that changing. Um, what else do you think will change in the sales development world? I mean, we've already discovered a lot has Change with the with the with the with coming of technology. What else do you mm -hmm. see, let's say, changing in the near future? We're not talking about three or four years in the future, like maybe six months, twelve months. Yeah, I think very quickly now, um, uh, the technology is going to start to converge. Um, meaning, yeah. you know, we've got five different tools that are all essential for us, um, and you have to pay five different vendors, and you have to click on five different screens. Uh, you're going to start to see those things fold on top of each other. Here's a really good example. If you're, um, uh, let's say you have the technology to do what we're doing right now, video chat, right? Right. You and I, we're exchanging a video feed back and forth to each other. Right. Inherent in that capability is the ability to do asynchronous video, right? So if I can exchange video with you live and see it in real time, like, isn't the technology that's underlying that uh, me to be able to like, funny enough, it, there was a problem in my video while I was talking about this, but um, <laughs> here's my point. If, if we can exchange live video back and forth, like why can't we exchange live video asynchronously? So like if I can send this video to you and you can send your video to me and we can watch it at the same time, like shouldn't I be able to like record a video and like send it to you that way? 
right? So there's two different companies, right? You've got uh, Vidyard and you've got Zoom and you're paying two different vendors, but like one of them should be able to do the other one, True. right? I, I think that that's, that's going to happen pretty quickly. I mean, that was just, video was just an example there. No, no, yeah, I, I get it, that. I, I think that... We've started that, yeah, that, we've started that, seeing those trends already. I think it's a matter of time when that, that starts happening. And I think it makes sense as well uh, because... I mean, it's it's hard for the ops person to manage. It's hard for a leader, for, uh, you know, for me to like evaluate different tools. I would rather evaluate one tool and get done with it. If I'm starting my uh, own SDR team for the first time and I, I know I need these five tools versus those fifteen, I would rather buy five and then say, you know what, just just take the money, right? It just it just makes sense if you're saving a lot of time on evaluation, going through the whole process, then the docu sign whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, where I think it comes from is, um, you know, the lean startup. Are you familiar with the lean startup? Um, this, no. this model of um, how, how companies start out. So there's, I think it was, a, it, was, it was a book called The Lean Startup. And the concept is that in order to go to market successfully, um, you know, you don't, you don't want to try to do too many things at once. You don't want to try to be a master of all. You want to have the minimum viable product that you can go to the market with that people are going to buy. And it's a good strategy because it simplifies things. You know, it makes it so that you get really, really good at this one area instead of, you know, having your hand in uh, uh, five different uh, things that you're trying to do at the same time. Uh, look, the, the same thing goes if you're playing a video. Are you, do you play video games at all? Have you ever done like like a role playing game or something like that? Yeah, of course I've played. I mean, I don't play like uh, normally I do, but yeah. You can't level up your magic skills and your fighting skills and your defense skills all at the same time. You just yeah. can't do it, right? It's like you get really, really strong in one area, but then the ecosystem that that creates is you have a an assembly of of um, point solutions, you've got a you, you've got a pile of different tools that are all really really good at their one individual area. Now the ecosystem itself, like um, just on the market, will then determine um, how those things are going to interact together, and then sort of the next generation or the next iteration of what of of tools that come out are, are going to have new information about how those things might work together. Um, in concert, and then all of a sudden, you know, they'll know what to build. They'll, they'll know how to put it together in an efficient way, which probably would have been invisible, um, you know, before we started with with the lean startup model. So I think that that's right around the corner. I think that's coming very soon. No, that makes sense. I can I can totally see that happening. Like with so many companies I know, and I'm pretty sure same same is the case everywhere. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, what else? I, you know, I, I had another thought too, and uh, I forget what it was, but uh, yeah, it, it just just uh, continue on with whatever else you're going to say, and it'll come back. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I think um, you know, for me, the, uh, the the path that took me here was basically not recommended. <laughs> like if I had listened to traditional advice, um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have um, accomplished the same amount. I wouldn't have learned what I did in a short amount of time had I, uh, you know, stayed in the same job for, for two years. Like the advice that you hear when you start in the industry is like, oh, you got to stick it out. You got to put in at least a year or two. You know, you get it, you get a pad your resume and, and you really got to do that. I was unwilling to compromise. So I sort of, I took my first SDR role and then um, I kind of outgrew it. And, and I don't mean that in a, in, you know, any way other than the fact that like I was doing really well in the role and I wanted more, I wanted to learn more. I wanted to be responsible for more. Um, I didn't want to just be, you know, uh, stuck dialing on the phone and, and really like, you know, pigeonholed into one specific mm -hmm. task. I'm like cleaning data in Salesforce and like, just sort of, I, I, I wanted to grow. I wanted to grow faster. And, uh, the company that I was working for, like they acknowledged that. And they also acknowledged the fact that they didn't really have a spot for me to grow into. Um, so I left and it was okay to do that. Right. Like, I think that a lot of people get this impression that um, that they're trapped. You know, they 
I've, I've seen it happen to many of my friends that are, you know, very smart and they're very successful, but they feel trapped. Like they're trapped in this role. They're like, oh, I can't leave. It's not going to look good on my resume. Uh, my advice to anybody out there um, that's, that's just starting out is like, please don't listen to that. <laughs> if it <laughs> feels like you can um, expand your horizons and you can learn new skills by going somewhere else, don't worry about your resume. Don't worry about how it looks to other people. Like, just follow what's in your gut. Like, do what you think is Patrick, right. Patrick, I wish I could, give, you know, come right there and give you a high five right now. I, I, I just love what you said right now. Why? Why is that? I can, I can totally relate to it. I mean, you, you haven't seen probably my resume right now. I have changed four jobs in the last 18 months for the same reason. I, I, I mean, mm -hmm. like, like everything what you just said kind of holds true to me. So I can totally relate to it. I am like probably the best example, not the best, but yeah, I'm probably a good example of why not to stick in a company when you're not enjoying it, when you, when you think, you know, you're kind of outgrown or when you see that, Hey, this is not the company probably where I can probably stay for like three or four years or maybe even for one year. Yeah. I mean, doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I just wanted, that's why I wanted to bring it up on the show because um, I think that there needs to be a voice out there that's saying that that you don't have to stay. I mean, the recruiters would tell you that, it, you know, you, you go, um, you know, your manager will tell you that because they don't want you to leave. They don't want to have to replace you and train somebody <laughs> else, uh, but they're going to tell you what's best for them. They're probably never going to tell you what's best for you. Like you're the one that has to decide that, right? Like the only person that's going to be looking out for you is you. And, and you, you have to make sure that you are, you have to keep your head on a swivel and, and make sure that you understand that, like, the people that are advising you and giving you advice, I mean, not everybody, not everybody, but uh, allow for the possibility um, that the HR department is looking out for the company. <laughs> they're not looking out for you. <laughs> uh, th their job is to make sure that they can get what the company needs out of you. They're not trying to make sure that the company, um, you know, does what you need. They're trying to make sure that the opposite is true. So, if I had listened to those um, to those people that, you know, to those voices that they were telling me that I should stay and that I should, you know, bide my time and, and you know, be patient and this, I would have never been able to go from, uh, you know, uh, entry level first year SDR to I'm consulting international, uh, you know, global firms that, you know, billion dollar firms. I'm, I'm on a Zoom call with Aaron Ross of Predictable Revenue. Wow. And, and advising, on you know, like I would have never had the exposure to even be able to speak to the points that I was speaking to on that call had I stayed in the first job. Like it just, it, it wouldn't have been possible. Uh, so I just, I feel like there's there's a voice that needs to be out there. Look, this is the best piece of advice that I got. If, if you pull anything from this podcast, it's this. There's three things that matter when you are evaluating a new position, a new role at a new company. Number one is the people. Number two, if you're in sales, it's the product market fit. And then number three is what's the upside? So how much money can you make doing this? Is there stock options? But that's the last thing you should evaluate. Like salary is important. You should be able to make money. But look, if you have good people and you have good product market fit and you're a salesperson, it should be natural. Like the product market fit is more important than the perks than the insurance, than this, that, you know, like the, the kombucha kegs they have and the snacks. It's like these companies have a really funny way, uh, you know, of, of putting really good snacks out when you go to the, uh, you know, your first screening interview, because they want to give you this impression that it's like this great place to work and you have all these benefits. But, uh, you know, what what's the product market fit like? Is there a demand for, for the, uh, you know, the software that, that they're selling? Are people buying this thing? Are other reps at the company making money? Like, are people making money here, right? Are, are we selling, are we making commission? Uh, you know, that to me is like, you know, way more important than, you know, like a, an extra 10K on the base salary or like this benefit or like, oh, this, you know, these guys let dogs in the office. It's like, dude, <laughs> you're, you're way better. You're way better off. Um, but, but all that considered, if the people that you're working with are not people that you get along with or that you feel like you can't trust, 
then it's all for it doesn't it doesn't matter. You should you should get out. Right. You no, should no. you should turn around and walk away if the if it, if that part of it isn't right, because ultimately um, those the people that already worked it, they're going to make it or break it for you. No, totally. You know, I, I can totally relate to all of that. Um, I think I've spoken uh, in the past about what what really defines a culture, because I think a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of youngsters, especially Generation Z. And again, I'm not trying to like single them out, but yeah, I think they have their own priorities. You know, millennials have their own priorities. And I think people, mm-hmm. the way people kind of look at the culture, like you said, you know, dogs being allowed, snack, you know, fully loaded pantry, a lot of people kind of pay attention to that. But I think those are the things, you know, which should be common, right? These are not, not the things which should help you differentiate or make your decision. I mean, if, if they give it great, otherwise I'm sure if you're able to make decent money, you can buy that, buy that for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I would rather, <laughs> I would rather um, sell something that, um, you know, the, the market was ready for like something that, that there's demand for it or, you know, I, I would rather much rather have that and buy my own coffee than, you know, to have free coffee, but then I'm, I'm miserable because I'm chasing leads and I can't, you know, I, I can't get anything to go. Um, and I only say this cause I've, I've lived through it. You know, like you said, you had, four jobs in 18 months. I think I haven't had a job longer than eight months in the past six years. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, and I've been pretty successful. I mean, it was okay. Like it, it ended up okay for me, even though I was unwilling to compromise on what my criteria was. Exactly. Yeah. I think I'm pretty sure uh, a lot of viewers will be able to get this and I hope they're able to, Listen to advice, which is other than mine. I'm sure that the third, third person's opinion is always better. So yeah, thank you so much, Patrick, for coming on the show and um, you know imparting all the wisdom. I'm sure there's a lot we can talk about, but I think we are on time. So <laughs> yeah, are yeah. there any parting words? Yeah, of course. Well, let me let me get one plug in there. Um, uh, the uh, there's there's two events um, that I'm I'm helping to organize the the uh, uh, the sales success summit is the first one that's going to be in October. Uh, I'm going to be a speaker at the event. Um, and it's in its top 1% uh, salespeople, like the top one percenters in, in the industry. Um, they all get together and, and they're going to share all their insights. Uh, so I'm going to be a part of that. Um, you know, if, literally just like hit me up on LinkedIn or, or you can, you know, my phone number's on there. You can text me. I can help you get tickets to that. And then the other one is the sales technology expo. Uh, and that's not going to be until, um, uh, April. Uh, but I just, I, I wanted to plug those two things. Absolutely, Patrick. I'm going to make sure I'm going to spread the word as much as I can. And I'll try to, you know, definitely attend that myself. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. That'd be awesome. Appreciate your time, Patrick. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks for watching this video. If you like the video a teeny tiny bit, would you like the video? Subscribe to the channel and tell me what you like. Throw your best insult at me if you did not like any part and you would want me to improve. I promise you will not offend me. Seems like too much work, right? Let's start with subscribing and let me know in the comments what I should cover next. Thanks again.